Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we welcome you. Among us stands one, and that's you. You are here with us now, and we welcome you and ask for your spirit to be at work in each of us as we hear your word and reflect on the grace and the glory of your presence among us. Amen. Please be seated. My name is Pete Mayberry. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's good to see you all. I don't typically come to the 930 service. We come at 8, and uh, so it's fun to see you all. Um, Here we are in the midst of what could well be, as Pastor Ken is fond of saying, our Adventist Advent ever. (laughs) Welcome to the third week of this. So two weeks ago, Bishop Ken captured how many of us feel in this season. He certainly captured me. And he said, I'm done. And my heart resonated with that significantly. We're done with this uncertainty and disappointment and the hurts associated with this season, this pandemic. And then last week, Pastor Ken encouraged us to reflect on what this desert season that we call 2020 actually has been for us. He said, write it down. And then right across it, God is coming right here. And I did that. I spent some time, and I meant to bring my journal, which I didn't, it's not here. But I wrote and listed all of these things that had happened in this season. And I could see God's presence in the midst of it. God has indeed come into the present, into this season. His friends, he is, that's his whole heart, his desire. The incarnation walks us into this. We are simply like so many generations of humans before us, being handed certain things in life to walk through that we never thought we would encounter. But here they are. And I was surprised this fall to find myself wrestling with anger in a whole new way that I had never experienced before. Now, mostly, I'm old enough to uh, hide that anger pretty well, except from my wife. She can see everything. Um, But there were times when the anger was just boiling over in my soul. And I couldn't tell you why it was happening. I couldn't explain it. Why did it emerge now? What's going on? I mean, there's nothing abnormal other than COVID tide. Well, the reality is... Life wears on us. Life just wears on us. And we tend to lose the resiliency that we get built up when we get to do all the fun things that we love. And Well, so certainly COVID tide had something to do with that. And it's not just my life, but so many other saints around us. But this is a great framework this season for us to understand What's going on in our gospel passage? So if you turn to John 1, we're going to pick this up and we're going to look at what was going on in the hearts and minds of the people here and the questions that were being asked. So we're in verse 19. John 1, 19. Now this was John's testimony. When the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. And he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Christ. Well, they asked him, well, then are you Elijah? He said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? No. So we're going to begin right there. The leaders of the Jews sending a delegation to figure out what's going on with this man, John. We don't hear their first question, but we infer by John's answer that they asked, are you the Christ? And with his negative answer, they follow on. Well, are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? These questions, these three persons really tell the story of their hearts. So let's take a look at it. They wondered, are you the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah? This was truly the one that all Israel longed for. For them, the hoped for Messiah would mean an end to 350 years of living under the rule of either the Greeks or the Romans. That's a long time. 
Imagine if we in our nation had continued under the English or perhaps the Spanish or the French since 1700. Other nations who can place their military in our streets, determine our taxes, set up our legal systems, on and on and on and on and on. At the time of Jesus, this had continued for longer than we have been a nation. Right here. And their hope was for a righteous king like David who would return Israel to independence and righteousness. So when John emphatically denies being the Christ, they just keep going down the list. Well, then are you Elijah? Okay, that question harkens back to the last prophecy in Malachi chapter 4. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Okay, so if you're not the Christ... Are you at least the forerunner? That would help us to know, okay, the Messiah is like right around the corner, and so that would be okay as well, and alas, no. So finally they ask, are you the prophet? And this is what refers to uh, Moses in Deuteronomy 18 when he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers, and you must listen to him. Another one like Moses. That could be great. He might lead the Jews on an exodus out of the misery of being occupied by the Romans. He might deliver the Jews from their current circumstances. But again, John says, no. What a disappointment. Three different ways to bring some hope. And John just keeps shutting the door. So let's continue in verse 22. Finally, they said, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Can you hear the exasperation in their voices? They really, really want to have some kind of an answer to bring back to Jerusalem. Something to explain John's popularity. Why are all these people trekking out into the wilderness to listen to him? And frankly, he was pretty hard to listen to and get baptized. They need to understand. Is John a harbinger of hope? Somebody that could truly fix their problems that they faced as a nation? A righteous king. I'd be so hopeful. Certainly those who had been golden years when we had King David, maybe. Or is there another problem here? Is this something that's dangerous? John's popularity is frankly a threat to the religious leaders. The masses streaming out into the wilderness to listen. This could be a harbinger, not of hope, but of a disaster. The fear they have is one of losing their place, their status, their way of life, their privileges. It's the same fear they had about Jesus three years later when they said, well, if we let Jesus go on like this, everyone will believe in him and then the Romans will come and they'll take away both our place and our nation. That fear was never far from the Jewish leaders. Their lives were tenuous. They were not in control. And friends, if we've learned nothing else this year, we're not in very much control either. And that same fear is not far from each of us today. Actually, it's constantly knocking at the door of our lives. This pandemic, with its shutdowns, its job losses, restrictions on our cherished freedoms, worshiping in the cold because of an unseen threat. These are losses that we face. Our freedoms, our choices, our rights, our health. We all have hopes and desires and longings and dreams. And so much of that has been dashed to the ground in this season with the threat of more of the same to come. Well, friends, their fears then and ours today need an antidote. For the Jews visiting John that day, the Messiah showing up would have been just the ticket a righteous, powerful king who would solve their problems. And our reading from Isaiah 
paints yet even more of the picture that the Jews had in mind. So if you could turn in your books, in your Bibles to Isaiah 65, I want to rest in this space a little while. He describes the world that his servants would inherit, starting in verse 17, Isaiah 65. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth, The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. At its core, the hope of the Jews was wrapped up in the coming of the Messiah, which ushers in the day of the Lord. Isaiah states unequivocally that this new age would recreate both the earth we dwell in and the heavens above. It's crucial that the heavens and the earth are created anew. We know there's a battle going on in the heavens, and that conflict deeply influences the brokenness we're dealing with here right now. And God says, I will redeem both. That's good news. The Jews saw the coming of the Messiah and the day of the Lord bringing righteousness and myriad other benefits. We obviously understand them as two separate events, advents of Christ, but we're strongly urged to keep our hope fixed on this second coming. Peter observes, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Like the Jews of John's day, we too want the righteousness that accompanies the return of Christ to wash away the filth and the degradations, the pains of living in this fallen world. So how does Isaiah describe this hope? Continuing, we see promises of a world and the life that would be a balm for us today. Verse 18, the Lord says he will create Jerusalem to be a delight and the people in it will be glad. Jerusalem here is a descriptor of this new creation that we are all going to enjoy. Verse 19, he's gonna bring an end to the sound of weeping and of crying. Our communities will no longer be filled with the tears that are brought about by unrighteousness and sin, we have had an abundance of that this year. Verse 20, long life will replace an early death. Again, we've had an abundance. Infants will survive to adulthood. Adults living to 100 will be commonplaces. Diseases will not be taking us out early. Instead, there will be good health. Verses 21 to 23, Fulfillment in our work will be the norm. I think all of us could hope in that. (laughs) Not the frustration that so often constitutes our work life today. For the Israelites, as an example, they had to live long enough to plant a vineyard and enjoy its fruit. It takes time for those things to grow. They'd wear out the work of their hands, the tools that they had made to work the land. Verse 24. Before we even call on God to express our hearts and our needs, he will be listening and responding to us, and we will know it. We'll experience that response, present. So often we pray, and then the bubble over our head says, God, did you even hear what I just asked? That will no longer be the case. We'll be in his presence His answers will come as we're asking. Verse 25, the predators, the dangerous ones, they'll be as gentle as a lamb. The wicked will not harm or destroy anymore. Friends, this is a deep hope. Beauty and delight No more tears, the life without disease, satisfying work, knowing God hears and answers us, dangers removed. This is what the Jews who came to John the Baptist wanted. It would have addressed their fears perfectly, and he told them, verse 26, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. the one who is standing among us right now. Our Savior, 
This is our hope. This is the return of Christ we increasingly yearn for. It's intimately connected to Christ's first coming and the redemption that he purchased for us on the cross. The new creation where life reigns, not death. And friends, because of Christ's first coming, his life, his death for sin and resurrection, we are even now bound firmly to Christ himself. The writer of Hebrews says it like this in Hebrews 6. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf. This is a tether fixed for us who believe. Jesus holds the other end, pulling us through the current suffering Jesus holds our souls firmly, securely for the future that is first coming and death purchased for us. This, friends, is the antidote for our fears, our griefs, our pain, our longings, just as it was for the Israelites of John's day. Jesus' grip on us secures us now for the future glory that is coming. But I can, I have my own bubble over my head that asks, oh, really? Because it's still hard. Does that eliminate all of our troubles? Well, of course not. As I said earlier, this fall, all kinds of anger was boiling up inside of me. We had hopes for this fall that we had to set aside. Disappointments that came one after the other Everything was less. But in God's mercy, a counselor helped me see what was happening inside of me. Connected it to some events that were awfully far in the past for me. And then he walked me through a great process to address those hurts that had really bound me. He encouraged me to describe each of the pains, the hurts that took place, bring it to the cross, and give it to Jesus, and declare forgiveness one by one for each action and word that had been so deeply painful. And this brought a freedom and a peace, a true foretaste of the new heavens and the new earth that I had not known for many years, a sense of shalom that I'm not sure at any point in my 40 five years of knowing Jesus has been as amplified. God brings himself into our present. So friends, as we journey through Advent, I invite you to meditate deeply on the grace that is now available to us through the work of Christ as he is present with us in the wilderness of our lives and tethered to us and cling to that grace that is coming when he creates the new heavens and a new earth, a place of delight and beauty where every tear will be wiped away as we enter his glorious presence. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we live in a time when we can look back at the first coming of your son, at his life and his death and his resurrection. And we can look forward as confidently to the day when his presence and your presence with us will be perfect, will be uninhibited, where we will see you face to face and experience life as you have intended it from before the foundation of the earth. Lord, give us the courage and the confidence to hold on to the line that tethers us to you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.